Hello and welcome to the next episode of Eldritch Girl, which is a bonus episode. And um, today we have the very elusive Guillaume Veld with us, um, who I've managed to track down. Um, he's a very difficult man to get hold of. <laughs> Uh, but Guillaume Veld has done a guest post for me on the blog before, um, talking about the Pagamon Sea Museum and Containment Facility. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit about his interests. Um, and as lockdown lifts, he's going to go back to town and uh, carry on with some of his research. So Guillaume, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's really lovely to, uh, to actually get to meet you at last. Um, so, yeah, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit um, and maybe say a little bit about uh, the museum and your research interests? Well, my, I, I am a wandering researcher, I suppose you could say. Um, I have a day job, but it mostly doesn't matter where I am when I do it. So... Um, I am free to pursue my research interests to a very great extent. Um, and these take me to Pagamon Sea fairly often. My major research interests are really in the histories and the folklore of coastal areas, um, especially around shipwrecks and wrecking, and both the actual history and the stories that people have spun based on that history. Ooh, very interesting. I mean, we should point out as well, this is Pagamon Sea East Sussex not yes Pagam West Sussex um yes so okay um tell us more about um can you tell us anything about what you're researching at the moment in terms of shipwrecks around that area of coast well Pagamon Sea pro um provides some unique challenges um and <laughs> some very interesting um history I mean, firstly, there have been the normal run of people just not looking where they were going. Obviously, there are rocks offshore. And um, if you look at a map of the south coast of England, there's just wrecks all over the place. You know, it's not particularly uncommon to have wrecking hotspots. Um, Pagham is not notable for the quantity of its wrecks, but it has some interesting special things about the ways that people tell stories about them and also due to some quirk of history some um, objects from a couple of very important shipwrecks have ended up in the museum here so it is a good place to be for what I am currently researching. Um, so Pagham had a bit of a wrecking problem as many areas on the south coast did where people would attempt to lure in ships by means of lights onto the shore to wreck them and steal the cargo yeah this usually involved also disposing of the unfortunate crew and you can certainly see um in eyewitness stories told by various people you can see evidence of unwarranted alcoholic bonuses say that were uh, either salvaged in fairly heavy double quotes <laughs> or um, simply smuggled on via the beach there. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was going to say, um, I know that the town does have, or had like a big smuggling kind of history. There's a there's a smuggler's tunnel, isn't there, that's, um, that runs like quite a way uh, kind of out, but it's meant to be underneath or come out of Fairwood House, which is quite yeah. away from the coast, actually. Yes, it is. Um, I think one of the reasons why there was such a big um, pre smuggling presence is simply that in Pagamon Sea, a lot of the people who were at least organising the smuggling were actually very well off and very well organised. Um, so this is not what you see in some places, which is sort of very freelance. I suppose these days you'd call it small business. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a coastal area and there was very, very, very much, um, even now, there was a great deal of um, what you might call individual level smuggling. Um, in, in Pagham, though, at, the, at, the, at its heyday, this was being actively funded by people who were quite well off and quite important, as far as we can see. And this is probably why the 
the main smugglers tunnel leads all the way to Fairwood House. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have no wish to besmirch the memories of individual families here, but as clues go, that is not a subtle one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one of them was, I, I think, I can't remember what, they're all called Peter or John or something, aren't they? Um, but like one of the Sorbonne's was the magistrate as well, which helped yes. at that time. Um, there are reasons why the excise were not notably successful in this area. Um, <laughs> and the fact that all of their liaisons in lo- what passed for local law enforcement were all quite cheerfully drinking smuggled brandy probably <laughs> yeah. accounts for this to a certain extent. There is an interesting social history yet to be written um, debating whether the... Um, people who ended up running the show actually planned to end up running the show and ran it like a business or whether they ended up um, in this position simply by consuming smuggled products and having to take responsibility and diverting attention more and more and more. Um, And it's entirely possible that um, the uh, savants in question, um, because there were multiple generations of this, it was a family business. Yeah. Um, (laughs) <laughs> the spots in question just kind of preferred not to think about it too much. Um, <laughs> and in fact, had simply ended up by ended up in that position by making a lot of decisions which seemed pragmatic and sensible at the time. And after after 20 years or so had actually put them in an extremely questionable legal position. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were into all sorts of things, though, that family... There's there's like a there's lots of links to the occult and um, all sorts of interesting rumours. Uh, yeah, I mean they they were just a very questionable bunch, really. I think they were just bad at saying no. Um, <laughs> it seems to be a family trait that I mean they were into the occult when it was fashionable to be into the occult. They were into smuggling when that was a way to make quite a lot of money. Um, uh, but again, I, I don't get the feeling that there was any organisation there. I mean, if you look at the the sort of the noble families or the semi-noble families, um, they are not up there among the great organisers or the great schemers. No. They just, yeah, yeah, that's get into, you know, they, they, they just have spent several centuries just narrowly escaping being in serious trouble that that's the entirety of their story (laughs) yeah yeah there were no great high points there were no great low points they just kind of just about escaped from penury with every other generation or so yeah i mean arguably until the very last one and that was like their their death duties had gone through the roof and uh was it said jack was very ill and um yeah yeah like that's yeah yeah I think I'd agree with that I mean that wasn't until sort of the mid to late 20th century anyway yes and um I mean an awful lot of families in a similar position whose wealth was not easily accessible necessarily um mm. who was bound up in land and and with various legal obligations attached to it found themselves in similar positions yeah yeah that's true um in terms of the wrecking um and uh the the kind of that history what would you say is uh some of the most interesting things to have come out of your research so far i don't think it was uncommon for wreckers to cultivate ghost stories um smugglers too very notably and i mean this shows up in quite a lot of fiction about smuggling too the idea that you put about the story that uh, so-and-so's ghost is wandering angrily on the shore at night for some ill-specified reason and that they will visit terrible vengeance, possibly involving a spike upon anyone who uh, who interferes with their um, nocturnal meanderings. Um, because if you can scare off the kind of people who are likely to believe in ghosts, then you've made an appreciable reduction in the number of people who are likely to interrupt you um (laughs) and also if you can if you can cultivate a kind of a supernatural air then people are just going to avoid the place at night 
anyway, which is, again, to your benefit, if this is somewhere you are doing something extremely legally questionable. Um, in Pagamon C, there is a slight complication here, of course, which is that there are lots of fairy lights. Um, there are lights moving at night, which at least nobody has ever admitted to. These days, when smuggling along the coast is rather rarer and much less well-funded, um, obviously there is still smuggling that goes on across the channel, but very little of it seems to end up in Pagamon Sea. You know, this isn't a... Um, it, it's not a, a particular hotspot of, of that kind of thing. Um, no. I know. You still get a lot of lights along the coast that really don't seem to have a purpose and that wander at will. And of course, if you are especially a sailing ship coming up past Pagamon Sea, whether the diverting light is being waved in the air by a wrecker or by a fairy is really slightly academic. Um, <laughs> the rocks are still quite spiky and... I mean, there are lots. I'm. I'm not. I do not wish to to besmirch anyone's good name, but there are lots of stories about kleptomaniac fairies. So the result may, in fact, be precisely the same. Um, and <laughs> in fact, the result is probably the same for people from the town as well, because if you interrupt a fairy on the cliff top, or if you inter interrupt a wrecker. The difference in what happens is largely going to be the precise manner in which you die. Um, because neither of them are notably friendly to people who wander up in the middle of the night asking bloody stupid questions. <laughs> no, that, yeah. Yes, that's very, very true. <laughs> so you have this interesting thing where you can't actually tell what bit is organic story, you know, the supernatural, like the fairy lights? What bit is kind of mythological posturing put about by the wreckers themselves? And which bits are just made up? Of course, there, there are grave difficulties in thinking and talking too much about things like the fairy lights, because you have to be very, very careful about what is story and what isn't anyway. But the presence of the presence of actual unexplained lights does make taking to bits the stories about wreckers significantly more interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to think of um, a good example that I've heard. Um, I know about, I mean, Seamus McVeigh is the obvious famous one. There's lots of urban legends and myths about, like local myths about him anyway, because he's the one that got buried alive in the smuggler's tunnel. And again, that's like Fairwood House related. Um, and um, you'll obviously, you know, um, Harold Bishop's book. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, so there hasn't been, I don't think there's been an updated version since like 1987, but like, um, so that's like the book obviously on um, the history of Fairwood House, which uh, for any listeners that don't know, um, and it's uh, published with um, Basingstoke University Press. <laughs> um, so I've quoted from that actually in my um, Folklore of Pagamon Sea, Volume 1, um, but not the Seamus McVeigh section. Um, but I'm going to kind of think about doing that for Volume 2. Um, so maybe actually Guillaume could uh, kind of reconvene and, and <laughs> for volume two of the folklore and I'll get you on some fairy lights and records. I, um, I think there is a very interesting situation here where um, Bishop and other people have really concentrated on McVeigh as a person and as an individual um, whereas the the social dynamics of the wrecking and the smuggling are more interesting because, of course, it's not just one person and it's not just one character doing it. Um, and there's all these social networks up and down the, the coast. Um, and as I said, in Pagham, that becomes especially interesting when you consider things like the fairy lights and what else might be trying to prey on shipping. Um, yeah. Absolutely. There are stories to be told about the interactions of smugglers and wreckers with other things that are trying to prey on shipping. Um, and I do not think some of those stories 
um, exist in oral history. There are some some trial records that had some more than usually odd stuff in, um, and <laughs> in the archives. Um, and I don't think those have been visited enough. I think that there's a very interesting study to be written in the future on that. Yeah, I, I was also thinking about um, Daniel Pierce's journals. Um, mm. So those the the um, he was a local farmer contemporary again, a, a McVeigh contemporary. So that's the 1780s, I think. Uh, seven, no, sorry, uh, 1740s, uh, way out. <laughs> Um, sorry, um, and they're in East Sussex Record Office, I think, at the moment. But I think when people look at Pierce's journals, um, I think you're right. Like I've had a brief look at them for for certain bits and pieces, but I think a lot of it is kind of um, neglected because uh, Pierce writes in a very, um, even though it's a personal journal a lot of what he's writing if it was if he was writing kind of blatantly would be very incriminating if those journals were found and it kind of reading between the lines you get the sense of this network of farmers and like gent as in like gentry farmers in that in that whole county who are all recipients of um some sort of ill-gotten gains but nobody's really talking about it in that sense and pierce's journal and, and um Pierce, of course, uh, uh, knew McVeigh, and we know that because um, not to not to focus too much on McVeigh as a person, as you say, um, but uh, there's a there's a story where McVeigh bet his pistols on a cockfight at the King's Head, and he lost them to Daniel Pierce, and so those pistols are now in the museum, aren't they? Yeah. As part of that, yeah, as as part of the um, the smuggling collection. Um, and so, but it's not like, you know, that that's kind of often dismissed or glossed as like a random encounter, but nobody's really asking, well, you know, who, who else was at these cockfights? And we know that um, events like cockfighting and, um, you know, a bit of like dog baiting and gambling and that, that, that was all going on at the time. Um, and there are that those social networks of people that, that overlap and map onto, you know, not just who was doing these sorts of activities, but also they were meeting, the deals they were making, um, all of that kind of stuff in terms of social networks. I mean, as in most towns, it would be very, very interesting to, instead of having all these official records, have a short but reliable list of who was going for quiet drinks with whom yeah uh, in this connection certainly um mm. but yes i i think it's not just that it it is as i said the fact that other things are likely to be preying on shipping um and yeah. fairy lights are possibly a a good indicator of that um and i think there are there are stories not so much of smugglers run-ins with other smugglers or smugglers run-ins with wreckers or either of their run-ins with sort of the their paymasters, I suppose you could say, um, but their run-ins with other things that they didn't really understand. Um, and there are some fascinating things which, um, which sound almost like sea monsters um, but are probably not actually sea monsters, um, described in, for example, some of the the investigations into some of the wrecks. And of course, those investigations were perhaps a little perfunctory, given some of the financial interests involved. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of stuff in there you wouldn't necessarily make up. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, don't, I think a lot of it has been kind of dismissed as well, because like there's nothing in the lighthouse logs. Is that right? Like the lighthouse keepers, um, there is a lighthouse and the lighthouse keepers have never recorded seeing anything unusual. The lighthouse was built rather later, though, and I think it's kind of important to remember that most wrecking activity had wound down um, rather before the lighthouse was built, uh, most the wreckers had moved on to um, to smuggling, um, or the, the wrecking families had moved on to smuggling by then, because presumably because it was lower risk. Um, 
So the lighthouse was not actually built to defend against wreckers. Um, the lighthouse was built as part of the wide ranging program to build lighthouses um, in areas where, where maritime safety had been a problem and especially in areas where navigation could be confusing. Um, so the building of the lighthouse, it's, it's really important to see in the, in the national scale um, because there was a big push to build lighthouses in the 19th century mm. um, where they were sensible to. And the threat that the lighthouse is defending against is much more the geography than the inhabitants in Bagham. Yeah. At, at that time. Now, the lighthouse is interesting because, as you say, the, the lighthouse logs, the logs of the lighthouse keepers, do not contain any of the scandal or social tension that you find in some other lighthouses where lighthouse keepers have perhaps gone a little bit strange. Um, now that's partly because it's less isolated than a lot of other lighthouses but at the same time if you look at the folklore around say the fairy lights and around weird happenings especially around the coast I mean Pagamon Sea is not short of weird happenings but especially the weird happenings that happen around the coast there is this kind of black spot around the lighthouse and it is remarkable that in a town notable for the richness of its ghost stories and f strange folklore and things going bump in the night as it were nothing at all has been said about the lighthouse even though it is a lonely place comparatively by the edge of the sea and lighthouses attract that kind of story um in fact as far as i can see the lighthouse never really saved anyone from wrecking it never really caused, you know, it was never involved in anything. Um, people sat there for ages until it was automated. And it just sat there, you know, it has, it, nothing interesting has happened in that lighthouse, which in Pagamon Sea makes it an intensely interesting place. And I know a number of people who are trying to work out what is going on there. Um, whether it is the lighthouse itself or the rock it is built on, um, yeah. because certainly there it is built on bare rock. You will note there is no soil on that headland, on that little headland. That the no, yeah, there isn't. It built straight onto bare rock, um, essentially, and there is some speculation that that may be part of the cause of it, but um, it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, that lighthouse is a bit of a, yeah, it's a, yeah, like a, you're right, like a black spot. It's just a, I can't, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting that that's, yeah, it's really interesting that you say that. Um, and it's it's interesting that um, it's, that the question about the rock itself as well, because, I mean, we know a lot about the soil um, of, of Pagmon Sea. Uh, well, maybe people don't who are listening. Um, so, uh, just to just to clarify um if if you um i don't know how to put this kind of delicately um the soil in pagamon sea is uh what we we describe as hyper fertile so um there's yeah so the local saying is don't plant uh, don't plant what you don't want to grow um or don't put in the ground what you don't want to grow uh which means anything of any organic material whatsoever um, especially at a particular time of year. Um, so that also means like your if if you do have to dispose of a body, don't bury it. <laughs> that's that's the official advice. Yes. Um, I mean yeah. it really there there was that kind of fascinating heyday of agricultural experimentation. And in Pagamon Sea, that just went in a slightly different direction with slightly different results than it did in much of the rest of the country. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. As a result yeah. of which, there is there are this 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 of course presents both opportunities and problems. Um, <laughs> no one is ever going to be short of fruit in Pagamon Sea. No, that yeah, that's very true. We are very blessed <laughs> down there. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, though, um, 
moving moving into that because we've we've uh, so fossils is is what I'm going to say to you. <laughs> Yeah, because there's a reason that the museum is called the Museum and Containment Facility. Well, so, yes, I, I think a certain amount of this is overreaction. Um, okay. But so the problem here is that um, if you are in a situation where everything you put in the ground that was once organic grows, you have a real problem when it comes to fossils. <laughs> because and for a long time nobody thought about this and this is really in, the really interesting bit is nobody everyone knew that you didn't bury people everyone knew that when you planted seeds you got incredibly fast luxuriant growth everyone knew about um the uh, interesting approaches to agricultural science that got us there they might not talk about it but it was generally a known thing um but nobody until really comparatively recently thought about the fossils which of course are underground and were once organic um and yeah. so the problem really here uh the problem here really began to come with the installation of civic infrastructure um and specifically sewers and pipe work um and I mean, let's just say when when a giant stone ammonite crashes unexpectedly through the wall of your sewer, <laughs> uh, you find yourself with problems on a number of levels, not just sanitary ones. Um, <laughs> mm, I shouldn't laugh. Well, I mean, that was very expensive. That was it was extremely expensive and it was absolutely terrifying. And no one really made the connection. Um when because of course it had been growing and it had been moving um because obviously when as it grows it's being pushed through the soil following paths of of less density you know it's growing in a direction and um one of these things came through the wall of the sewer and people were like what on earth is going on here um and so they patched it up the sewer, uh, not the ammonite. The sewer, not the ammonite. The ammonite was the, the, the ammonite was in great condition. Um, <laughs> we, we've still got it in the museum. Um, yeah. I see it. It's fucking massive. <laughs> it's huge. It is enormously huge. Um, and, I mean, then, um, then a little while later, uh, a couple of years later, another one did the same thing. Um, and people ran around waving their hands in the air going, you know, what's going on here? What's wrong? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there was much um, conspiracy theory and occultism going on around this. Um, and then a third one uh, occurred. Um, and, you know, once is a coincidence, twice suggests malevolence. But on the third time, you have to admit there's probably a design flaw somewhere. Um, and <laughs> this, this was the event that firstly got people to um, understand that they needed stronger sewers in power. <laughs> yeah. Secondly, got people to take seriously that they they had a whole new set of hazards to deal with when installing infrastructure in general, uh, not just sewers. Um, uh, I mean, a, a suitably large um, trilobite will will quite happily just cut through a phone cable like it's nothing you know but also this was the these were the events that got people thinking about what was going on here um and the the design of the containment facility was partly a response to a threat to infrastructure and people think it's this terribly you know um occult malevolent thing um which is because they're th still thinking in a two sewer interruption world rather than a three sewer interruption world um <laughs> Right, yeah. Because people want there to be this great eldritch uh, threat to the world, where what there just actually is, is large bits of stone that will screw up your infrastructure. Um, anyway, yes. Um, so what they did was um, they began mapping out the contours in the ground, which some people call ley lines. Um, and they did this with very precise, very precisely balanced dowsing rods. Um, 
the especially let's not forget that especially the late 19th century was really a heyday of precision instrument manufacturing um so when i say precision dowsing rods i mean it these were very very carefully designed surveying instruments eccentric perhaps but very very carefully thought through and what they did was they made sure the sewers ran with the contours with the ley lines rather than across them because of course the um because of course the fossils were trying to move along the contours too so if you had your sewers running parallel to where the fossils were trying to migrate for want of a better word um it was massively less likely that they would be collided with um and this kind of surveying still actually has to be done before major projects um in case anything has shifted underground or in case anything is still moving. We think we've got all the really big ones now, but we wouldn't necessarily know until it actually hits something. Um, so it's good practice to install things where possible in such a way they won't, won't get hit by migrating fossils. Um, so Pagamon C, for fans of infrastructure projects out there and infrastructure installations, Pagamon C is the only place you're likely to see a telecoms engineer wandering around in a high-vis jacket with a dowsing rod and a GPS receiver attached to it um, and making careful notes about um, where the dowsing rod dips and does not dip. Um, and most of the telecoms companies especially are kind of resigned to this now, but some of them are... Still- <laughs> Still kick up a bit of a fuss, but fortunately the council insists because uh, it has to it, be done, really. Yeah, it has to be done, doesn't it? It's just such an expensive way to, <laughs> to, yes, to run your life. And yeah. it, it does amuse me that people, as I said, think about the containment facility as this kind of eldritch uh, occult thing, whereas actually it is to make sure the phones and the sewers keep working. There's a kind of a, an amusing um, juxtaposition there, an amusing contrast. <laughs> I uh, mean, the, the fossils don't move when they're out of the soil, we should... Yes, exactly. Point out. Um, <laughs> that's that's yeah. why the, the containment facility is designed the way it is, um, so that they... Uh, I mean, the fossil exhibitions are, of course, presented fairly um, conventionally, because in that context, you know, they're in a display case, they're off the ground. It's quite easy to stop them accidentally... Uh, getting thrown out or being a problem um in the actual storage uh places the the fossil storage is very carefully kept above ground on um plastic legs and the point is that a fossil should never be able to touch the ground now this is in my view an absurd overreaction um as as the as are the extremely as are the very serious security uh, restrictions around them, um, because these things do not move fast when they are in the ground. Um, And even if one escaped and touched the ground, you would probably have a good four or five days before it had submerged itself. You know, these things do not move fast. So um, I think, so a certain amount of this is overreaction in my view, but it makes for an an interesting um, exhibit. Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I think it's, it's really, not, I, I'm really looking forward to when the museum can reopen after lockdown and we can all sort of go back in and have a look. And um, are you going to be going down there uh, when, we, when we're opening kind of um, April time, but are you going to be going down there soon? Yes, I'll be going down um, as soon as is reasonably possible. There are some objects in the museum I, I wish to look at, um, except for the one that's gone missing. Uh, which I will have to look at the place where it isn't, which is very annoying. Um, but they keep lo- there's a, there's a table they keep losing. Um, it loses itself, they say. I don't necessarily understand what they're going on about there. But uh, every time anyone, it, it always, every time anyone catalogues where it is, it isn't there. Next time they look, and it's odd because they're usually quite careful um, with their. Um, their inventory management and their collections management down there. Um, so it's a little bit odd that something the size of a table would continually go missing. But when they find it again, maybe they'll be able to keep track of it for long enough for me to go and see it. Um, Is that from a wreck? Yes, yes, yes. 
yeah. it, it, there's a collection of um, rather odd items from a Robano British shipwreck, which actually happened at the entrance to the Solent. Um, it's not quite clear how the objects have ended up in, in Pagamon Sea Museum, but uh, I'm glad they have because it means I can um, I can consult them and examine them on my trips down there rather than having to make another trip. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's good. Uh, what's your favourite collection that's not that we haven't mentioned? Which one are you really looking for just to browse around as opposed to study? Probably the the Arbutus collection. Oh, yes, I love that one. Which has so many stories in it um, on so many levels. Um, the Arbutus collection is, is, the coll- is the multi-century collection of women's neckwear, um, for those who don't know, by a, a, a vampire called um, Jeremy Arbutus, who gave the collection to the museum um, when the museum opened. And not all the parts of the collection are in particularly good condition. I mean, each one, uh, as is well known, each one has a single bite mark in it. Uh, Arbutus was a vampire and um, it comes with the territory. Um, Unfortunately, some of them are also a bit stained um, and this this kind of there's there's a, a regrettable prejudice which is even more regrettably um, backed up in fact that vampires can be very messy eaters and one or two <laughs> of the, one or two of the the parts of the arbiter's collection really do show that um but the the so the the, com, the social history the person of jeremy arbutus the fashion jeremy arbutus was a very prolific vampire um, and very, very keen on consent, which makes him a very interesting and good counterpoint to the prejudice against vampires, they don't, that they don't really care about humans at all. Um, and I believe, he, I believe he is being used by the vampire community as a, uh, in initiatives to underline the importance of consent and good human-vampire relations. Um, more recently that's more your area than mine I'm not yes I mean obviously it helps that but I say helps that he's no longer with us but um (laughs) uh yeah he's very much the poster boy for historical um responsible vampirism yes yes uh and saying this is not a new thing this is actually very much uh you know there's a precedent for it yes very part of vampiric culture which I mean yes most vampires have never been in any doubt of, but the humans need reminding on a distressingly regular basis. Yes, uh, and also uh, one might argue some of the newer vampires yes. um, on the scene, and it depends how. I mean, there's this whole conversation about. Um, yeah, I mean, we're getting into into some very uh, complicated undead discourse at this point. So I think we'll be right. I'm not intending to... No, no, yeah, let's leave that alone. But um, it is certainly interesting that that he can be and is used as a a stick to beat humans with, shall we say, about vampires being able to not just be the rather one-dimensional predatory monsters of so many unfortunate stories yes and i, I mean vampires do also benefit from very good media pr at the moment yes. so where where are you going to be staying then where um because if you're going to go down where i, I mean I, I can't imagine a lot of places are open where do you normally stay um i i often stay at the king's head um oh yeah that's nice i like it in there it isn't particularly prone to dramatic hauntings. It does a decent pie and chips. And some of the bands they have there are quite nice. And they finish early enough for me to go to bed. So, I mean, it's it's great. It's nice. And it's much nicer than any of the chain hotels or, or that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think you just got, like, the travel in and that's a bit like... Yeah. 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 yeah anyway. I mean, I, I really like the King's Head though. Um I like the um 
I like the dual story that they've got on the wall, you know, in the snug, like oh, the yes. uh, swales versus eels. <laughs> I love that. Oh, yes. Do you want me to tell that one? Yes, you tell, you tell that one. Here we go. So, so in, in, this is in 1716. Um, there was an ongoing feud between the landlord of um, the King's Head, which was uh, Thomas Swales at the time, and the landlord of the Exchange, uh, which is um, a couple, just kind of like uh, you sort of go out of the King's Head and turn left and the Exchange is then like on the end of the road. But like, yeah, you know, you, you know where I mean. Um, and that was sort of for the affections of the recently widowed Maria Witten. Um, so they fought a duel in what's now the beer garden of the King's Head, um, which was at the time where they did, you know, sort of cockfighting and, and sort of like we, we mentioned before. Um, and Swales chose pistols and he shot Eels in the shoulder. And Eels shot Swales in the thigh, I think. And they both kind of got patched up and survived the resulting infections, <laughs> um, only to find out that Widow Witten had run off with Captain Nathaniel Black of the Royal Navy. So <laughs> it was like just generally devastating for everyone. Um, and they've got that story on the wall um, in just in the in the snug, which is really lovely, um, along with um, like a little painting of, of swales. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the little the little portrait. Because doesn't he haunt the pub? Well, Swales. they say so. Um, yes, he does haunt the pub. Um, also, they say. Um, I've never seen him. Um, but they they certainly have a reputation of being haunted by him. And they do say um, on a dark night, you know, as is traditional, you know, on a dark night when everything is still, you can hear him stomping about outside, complaining about the price of lamb. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that story. I haven't heard him. I haven't heard him either. But um, yeah, that's what they that's what they say. He, he say says- he, he swears something terrible, they say. Um, <laughs> See, the problem is, like, it's Pagamon C. How would you tell that it was a ghost? <laughs> Just anyone. <laughs> I mean, yes, yes. I mean, I've, I've said some choice things in that beer garden myself, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, it was, well, I think. That's all we've got time for, unfortunately. But um, maybe I'll see you down there when you're next next about, because I want to go back down as well. But um, yeah, it was absolutely lovely to have you on the show. Thank you so much for sharing um, about your research and stuff. And we will reconvene at a later date, hopefully. Um, having me. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll have you back on the show at another time. That would be lovely. Um, that's all we've got time for thank you for listening Um, on Thursday we've got the next instalment of the crows to listen to Um, so stay tuned don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you on Thursday bye now